Hello, and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin English, founder of The Silver Edge. Our mission at The Silver Edge is to inspire men and women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond to live their strongest, healthiest, most fulfilling lives. In this podcast, we share stories of amazing individuals who are doing just that to help motivate you to become the healthiest version of yourself, regardless of your age. And now, on to today's podcast. Hello, my guest today is Ryan Smith. Ryan's a 58-year-old plant-based CrossFit athlete, a Navy chief, and a drag racer. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks for being on. Hey, uh, certainly want to talk to you about all of those things, but let's back up a little bit and start at the beginning. Can you tell us what you were like as a kid? Were you active as a boy? I was very active. Uh, I grew up in a subdivision, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. We didn't have TV. Uh, we did. We had a radio. That was about it. But we were always outside playing, whether it was laser tag or wiffle ball or backyard football. Uh, that's what we did. I got very interested in the baseball and joined a little league. The guy up, the, one of the neighbors up the street was a coach. So in our subdivision was called College Park. So all the street names were named after colleges and I lived on Baylor. We had a ball diamond in our subdivision. So we had a couple of different little leagues uh, going on and that's kind of how my baseball got started. And I played all the way up through Pony League uh, up in the high school. But I really had no direction uh, to go to college or kind of anything like that. Uh, I, I didn't really have a role model, you know, as, as somebody that I could lean on and kind of figure out a way of life. So when I graduated high school, uh, I spent two years kind of fumbling my way through and then decided to join the Navy. And that was in 1982. Okay. So uh, in 82, you're, you're out of high school. You're kind of looking for direction and you find the Navy. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing they whip you into shape there, right? They really do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was 100, 152 pounds, six foot one. So, and you're you're still active today in the military, is that right? No, I, I've been out, uh, I got out in 1994. All right. And your time during in the, in the Navy was, uh, I'm guessing, pretty fairly active that entire time? Yeah, they really did. Uh, There's a lot of PT. A lot of physical demands on you. On the off time, uh, being on base, we got to play racquetball, uh, weight train. Uh, CrossFit wasn't invented back then. Uh, we didn't have anything like that. So it was picking up tennis or picking up racquetball or a softball game or indoor basketball. But I always stayed active. I always really enjoyed sports. Okay. So it sounds like you're active all the way through your childhood, your teen years, and certainly young adult. Um, when you get out of the Navy, what's, what's, what are you doing with your life at that point? Well, I'm looking for a job. I'm an electrician. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got into explosive ordnance uh, when, I, when I was an E5. So that, that's really a lot of uh, activity going on. So I was actually very physically fit. I got out of the Navy. I was looking for a job and I got in at, at uh, Case Tractors where they make uh, International Harvester. Mm -hmm. I worked there six years, um, still played racquetball. Uh, I picked up a little bit of jujitsu. I didn't really care for it. Uh, I found yoga back then, and I, I kind of really liked doing yoga. Five years later, I left there, and I started a career at Harley-Davidson. And I spent uh, 19 and a half years there, and I just retired from there last month. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw some of your posts and you, you, you mentioned Harley Davidson in there. So I, I assume maybe that you had a, a career there. So during that time, it sounds like maybe, maybe family came along in there as well. Yeah. I had a daughter, um, wife, mm -hmm. uh, all very active. And about six years ago, uh, actually it was six years ago, this Sunday, day before Memorial Day, uh, started a whole life change for me. I contracted a bacterial infection in my lungs at work, and I, I didn't know that that's what it was. So I was working with another partner uh, on a wash tank, actually, and I told him, I said, you know, I, I, I'm having a hard time breathing. Whatever this stuff is in here, it's really starting to affect me. Is it bothering you? He says, yeah, it kind of is, but let's just kind of work through it, and we'll be done with it. Well, by the time the end of the shift was done, I really had a hard time breathing. I mean, I was really struggling. 
So I started on coming home. I ended up stopping halfway to an urgent care. And I, I told them I'm having problems breathing and blah, blah, blah. Well, they put me on some ibuterol and some prednisone. I left there. I got home. I thought, I, I got to go to emergency room. There, there's something wrong. I can't breathe. And what was happening is my lungs were full and I couldn't exhale. And I couldn't understand what the heck was going on. So I, I got into the emergency room. I spent three days there, all full of IV. They pumped everything into me that they could think of. And I was, actually, I was feeling pretty good. I went back to work, and that night I had a relapse where I couldn't breathe again. So I drove myself to emergency. I spent another four days in there. Now, what happened, what happened that time, I, re, I distinctly remember, I stood up to give my daughter a hug. I started coughing a little bit. And the next thing I knew, everything was black. And when I opened my eyes, it looked like she was standing on a pier and I was swimming up to her and swimming and swimming. I thought, you know, I'm going to run out of breath. I'm just going to kind of take it easy and, and, you know, hopefully my breath lasts. I kind of went black again. When I opened my eyes, I was sitting in a chair. All these doctors were around and sirens going off and. I, I told my daughter, it's like, hey, you know, how's it going? She's like, Dad, do you realize what happened? And I said, no. I said, it was kind of odd. I was, uh, like, swimming up to you on the pier, and I couldn't get to you. She goes, Dad, you completely passed out. You were coughing, lost your breath, and you, you completely flatlined. And that, you talk about a scare. So I spent four days on that stent. I got out two days later. I had another relapse. I was back into emergency room. That's when I saw a pulmonologist. Uh, the pulmonologist told me, he says, I know what your problem is. There's a, a bacteria growing in the coolant. When we come from the machining world, any, any kind of CNCs, they have a thing called coolant. And it's a liquid that cools the tool and, and lubricates. It's kind of like a cutting fluid, but it's water-based. So when these machines, they leak hydraulic fluid or anything like that, they grow bacteria. Well, that got into my lungs. And I'm telling you, I had to fight for my life. So they had me on prednisone, ibuterol, and they had me, uh, gave me a nebulizer, which is kind of a, puts a medication in and you breathe it. I had to have an, a nebulizer every two hours. And I was so embarrassed at work to have that. I put that in my file cabinet. I pull that thing out and I'd be sucking on that thing because I'd be coughing and, and I had a hard time breathing. We'll make a long story short. After a year of being on prednisone, I blew up to 295 pounds. Wow. And now what, what was your weight prior to getting sick? 220. So yeah, that's pretty significant. I went from an extra large because I'm a big frame guy, I got big wide swimmer shoulders. I went from an extra large to a 4X. And it didn't really hit me until I saw a picture of myself with my daughter. It was January of 16. When I saw that, I couldn't believe it was me. I, had, I, I couldn't believe it. That prednisone has such bad side effects. So I decided I had to take my health into my own hands. And, you know, God bless the person that created YouTube. Because there's so many healers and influencers on there that know what they're talking about. You know, you talk about Esselstein and Gregor and Pam Popper and, and Mike Clapper and uh, Mindy Peltz, he, all those kind of people, uh, medical medium. All these people have the information that you need to bring your health back. And that's what I did. I healed myself through these people. I got myself off of prednisone. I found a plant-based lifestyle. Uh, I still had a lot of phlegm that I couldn't get rid of all this mucus that was creating. Um, so I found pineapple was a mucus killer. I started eating pineapple and the mucus and the phlegm started going away and I wasn't wheezing like I was. And I thought it, it can't be this simple. It just, it just can't be. So I quit eating pineapple and guess what happened? Mucus started coming back. The wheezing started coming back. So that's how I proved to myself that uh, some of these things that work. There's certainly something to be said about taking taking your health, taking responsibility for your health, right? Like you said, taking it into your own hands and getting out and exploring some optional 
ideas. And certainly there's a concept of food as medicine, exercise as medicine. And uh, I think probably most of the folks listening to this show would subscribe wholeheartedly to that. So let's, um, let's dig in a little bit. You, you mentioned that obviously you're looking at ways to improve your health. You, you found yourself all of a sudden extremely unhealthy after a, a, a pretty catastrophic medical event. Did So the veganism or plant-based lifestyle that came along in the same, about the same time as well? It did. It did because um, I was always constantly bloated. I could never figure out why I was bloated. Every time I'd eat, I'd be bloated. But I did a lot of meat and I had a lot of dairy. That was, that was my diet, so to speak, my lifestyle. Once I ridded myself of meat, I didn't have any bloating anymore. There was no, no bloating whatsoever. And my body just, it just felt so refreshed and healthy with plant food. Right. I got rid of dairy. I drink almond milk. Mm -hmm. Um, I have vegan butter. I'll have vegan cheese, um, the, all the plant-based stuff. And it's, it's my, my health has really taken off. In fact, I had my last physical just February. My doctor told me, uh, and I have to have a physical every year for my drag racing license. I have to, I have to have that to renew my license. He says, you know, I, I've been watching your trend for the last eight years. I don't know what you're doing, but there's nothing that you can improve on. Your collect everything is where it, it needs to be, and I I kind of don't believe in those numbers. I think we're all we're all built different, right? Right. If you say this is what your blood pressure should be. It's just it's just a number. Every every one of us are are built different. So I don't you know your BMI. I'm obese. Look at me. I'm not obese, but the BMI says I'm obese because of those numbers. You know. But she told me there's nothing that you can improve on. Nothing. I, she's like, I can't believe it. What are, what are you doing? And I told her, and I get the same question all the time. Where do you get your protein if you're not eating meat? Right. I get that all the time. You have to eat meat. No, I, I don't. I don't have to eat meat. And I don't, you know, this, it works for people. It works, doesn't work for other people. You know, you have to find what fits in your lifestyle. And that's what I did. Right. And remind us again, how long, how long has this been when you made that change, when you found yourself at that, uh, at that heavier weight? Yeah. Six years ago, I was, um, this weight, uh, actually five years ago, five years mm -hmm. ago. Okay. Uh, so I was like that for a whole year. January 16 is when I saw this picture of me and my daughter. I thought that's what I look like because the, the coat size and stuff, it didn't, you know, just think, ah, oh, just, I just need one more size bigger. I just need one more size bigger. Well, now I still have all those coats and those shirts. And when I put them on, I can actually fold them over both ways. And I just can't believe I was that big. I just, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So that, that sounds like quite a, quite a transformation. Now, as, as you're coming out of this illness and you're starting to change some, some other things, clearly your diet being a, a big one. How did your how did your activity or your working out play into that? Was that a part at that time, or did you add that maybe back into working out? Right, I had to add that back in. So I was on uh, third shift at the time. I decided, you know what, I'm going to go join the Y, see what they have to offer. Right, so I would uh, be on the elliptical or I'd be on the treadmill. Uh, I walked by a spin class, and I thought, you know, I kind of want to try that. So I got in a spin class about a year which now it turns out that instructor is now my yoga teacher. Yeah, so I, I did that. But, you know, I'd be walking by somebody and I'd say hi and nobody would talk to you. Everybody's got their, they're in their own little world, right? They got their earpiece in and nobody talks to you. And I'm still dealing with, um, with my asthma, so to speak. So that's kind of what it turned into, especially a sports-induced asthma. I get on the treadmill and I'm wheezing and I'm coughing and I'm trying to make it through. Then all of a sudden, it clears out and, and I'm good to go. Kind of like a second win. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I did on this prednisone is I would eat and eat and eat. Not even being hungry, but I would eat. It was it was comforting. And that's, that really contributed to me just blowing up into this big, massive guy. So I wasn't happy with the why. So I started going back on YouTube and I found a video called Killing the Fat Man. Right. Gary Robertson about about how he would eat and eat and he would go out to dinner and 
and have these little small meals because he would eat before. And I thought, CrossFit? What the heck is CrossFit? I watched everyone. I think there's maybe 13 videos in that series. And I watched his transformation. And I watched everybody, how happy everybody was. And if you're not done with a workout, people are clapping and they're, they're motivating you. And I thought, man, I think I could fit into that. That's, that's me right there. It's not me walking around with my headset, not talking to people. It's not me not motivating others or, or get motivated. I got I to gotta look for that. So I did. I found a CrossFit gym, which is right down the road from me, about, about 10 minutes. And uh, I went in there, and uh, I was on my way to a school for robotics in Chicago. And he said, why don't you stop in on Saturday? You can work out with a partner. We'll find you somebody. See if you like it. I thought, I'm going to do that. So I showed up at 8 o'clock. Didn't know a soul. I walked in. The coach introduced me to everybody. People shook my hand, and everybody was so friendly. And I thought, wow. He said, I'm going to pair you up with this guy right here. And he was half my size. And uh, his name was Raj, little Indian guy. And I said, uh, yeah, okay, I'll work out with you. So I did, you know, uh, you know, he was doing pull-ups. I was doing push-ups. It was a partner workout, partner workout. And uh, I'll tell you what. He beat the crap out of me to the point where I was like, and I'm, I'm going to lose my broccoli. I went outside and, and, and that was it. I came back in and I signed a check. I said, sign me up. This is, this is me. And you know what? I, I, I've never looked back. That's awesome. And I, I've heard that story many times. And I think that um, a lot of non-crossfitters don't understand that a real part of that attraction, maybe the largest for most people is that community. It's just such a, it is such a solid community, a supportive community. And you're right that, you know, the global gyms and these other forms of exercise all have their place, but it's not for everybody. And to your point, the, you know, the global gym, I can remember my days there. You're exactly right. The ear, when you walk in, the ear pods go in and um, you kind of tune everybody out and it, there isn't really any community to speak of. But CrossFit's all about community. In fact, I, uh, my brother jokes sometimes, says, uh, yeah, that's like a, some kind of fitness commune or something. Uh, it kind of is, right? It's, it really is supportive and wonderful. So how many, how long ago was it when you, when you found CrossFit? Three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago, you walked in, tried a class and gave Never your check. You, you signed up. Never looked back. Never looked back. Great. And then in those three and a half years, talk to us a little bit about CrossFit and how, you know, a little bit about maybe their methodology, methodology and how you just work that into your, into your lifestyle. Well, you know, as with anything else, um, there's, there's always a, uh, the trial period where you're all happy and everything is going good. And then, you, you know, you may suffer an injury or maybe a setback that you don't maybe want to continue or kind of lose interest. That that never happened with me. What did happen was I decided to try competition. And uh, it was a male, female with a combined age of 80. Right. Okay, so, nice. Yeah. yeah. So I said, you know what? I'm Yeah, why not? I'll do it. So uh, one of the girls at, at my box, she's a nurse. Uh, she's 27 at the time. She's like, hey, uh, I'm interested in doing this. Would you be my partner? I'm thinking, you want me to be your partner? Me? She's like me. So I, I said, well, let's do it. So out of 27 teams, we got ninth. I was awesome, yeah. so happy, but I'll tell you, I was beat and beat up. Yeah. Um, so I decided to do another one, and I did it with Raj, my original partner that started me off on day one. Uh, we, we took third place that event. Again, uh, combined age of 80. Nice. Well, so it's, you know, it's just a lot of fun. And I've met so many people. I've met recovering alcoholics. I've met drug addicts. I've met uh, so many different people with so many different walks of life. But we're all like-minded. We're all rooting for everybody. And it's just just the community. You just, there's nothing like it. Not that I've, that I've seen, that I've been a part of. There's just nothing nothing like it. We have fun together. We party together. We go out together. Uh, we have our own uh, Friendsgiving and Thanksgiving. You know, we do uh, all of our hero wads together, you know, on the holidays. Uh, Murph, we're doing the 4th of July because we're just all kind of getting back. Nobody's really in the right shape to do it. So uh, they decided to do it on the 4th of July. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just great. Just my, my life has changed so much 
Uh, I've got rid of everything that's toxic, including that. And that's a big reason why uh, I retired from Harley Davidson. The environment, a lot of the people, the negativity that's there now. I just wanted to rid my whole life of that. And uh, I think everything is really coming into alignment now. That, yeah, that's awesome. So I know when we talk about wellness, there's this holistic approach, right? You've got, certainly you've got to have some kind of functional or some kind of movement um, exercise. You've got to have um, your nutrition dialed in, certainly your recovery dialed in, but there is a social, uh, social, psychological, emotional, uh, even spiritual component to being, to being a whole, whole person. And environmental is, is one that oftentimes gets overlooked, whether that's like you said, it's, you know, maybe toxic people, toxic, literally toxic work environments, things that are, are no longer serving you and, and growing as a human. Certainly that it sounds like you're in that stage of your life then. I believe so. I, and I, I concentrate a lot on recovery. Um, I bought an infrared sauna. Uh, there's a lot of research on infrared. Uh, so I sit in my sauna 40, 40 minutes every night, looking into an ice bath right now, making my own ice bath. I go to acupuncture once a week. I go to yoga uh, four times a week. Uh, I do my own cupping. So any kind of soreness I have, um, I bought a cupping kit and I do my own cupping. Um, I incorporate a lot of ginger, a lot of turmeric into my lifestyle, a lot of berries, a lot of anti-inflammatory food for recovery. And what about supplements? Do you use a lot of supplements? No, I just take uh, vitamin Bs. Okay. That's, that's really all I take. No protein powders no. or um, nothing like that? Okay. No, yeah. I don't count calories. Yep. Okay. No, I don't do any of that. I mean, I can back squat 335 right now. You're, yeah, you're doing okay, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing fine. And I don't even need to do that, you know, just that they're always – they're always on me at the gym. Come on, you know, throw a couple more plates on. It's so easy. Come on, I'm thinking, I'm not 25 like you guys, you know. Things are a little bit different when you get in this age group. They really are. I go to the games every year up in Madison because I only live about an hour away, you know. And, and I watch those guys that are 55, 60, and I'll tell you what, it it takes their toll on them. God, I mean, God bless those guys. Mm -hmm. Certainly at our age, the the recovery is is the is like to it is. You, know, you just reference it. That's really the hard thing, right? I'm, I feel like I can really push hard sometimes, but I'm not going to recover like I did when I was 20 or the, some of these younger people do. And you're right. Those those athletes at the games, those are very grueling tests. And those guys, are, they've got to be subhuman freaks, right? To exactly. be able to recover, to, to keep pushing like that. And if you look at their workout routine, they, they work out hours out of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm just, you know, hip and steel. Look at that guy. He's a, yeah. he's, he's a beast. Yeah. He tells you, I'm in pain a lot. You know, I'm always getting massages and my wife helps me out and, you know, yada, yada, yada. That's just not my lifestyle. Uh, I'm just, I want to stay fit. I want to stay healthy. And that's my goal. It's not to be, you know, a big muscle head, you know, and have a 60 inch chest. That's, that's not my goal. It's just to stay fit and, and, and true to myself. That's very well said. And what would you say to somebody our age who's um, thinking CrossFit? Well, I've, I've heard that's really dangerous, especially for older people. And yeah, I, I hear that a good bit myself. Um, how do you re respond to that? I do too, but everything is scaled. You can do the same workout as the 20 year old, just not as heavy weights, just not as the, the movements. And it's never too late to get started. I don't care what age you are. It's just never too late, but you got to take it into your own hands. No, nobody's, nobody's going to do it for you. Again, well said. And I think both of us have similar experiences there. We both started CrossFit. I've, I've been just under two years. Um, and that was my, you know, my daughter dragged me into it, my teenage daughter. And uh, my biggest concern was, I don't, I don't want to get injured. I don't want to get hurt, but I approached things in that very cautious manner, trying to honor where, what my body was ready for and not worry about what the guy or gal next to me was doing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you get hit by a bus tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. no. I used to live to work. Now I work to live. I've really changed my whole outlook on life. And I, I think that that comes with age. Yeah. You know, you start to look down the road and, you know, I watch I watch some of the younger guys, how they push it so hard. I mean, really push and push. And I'm thinking to myself, man, 
you guys just wait till you get in your 50s, your middle 50s, upper 50s. You better take care of your body. Right. Because it's it's going to happen, you know. And it, it's the only one you got. Exactly. It's Man. the only one you have. Well, I think that's a, a pretty good, uh, I think we have a good feeling for where you are right now in your life, how how you got there from a, certainly from a fitness perspective. Let's shift gears just a, a minute, pun intended, and talk a little bit about drag racing. So is this something that you've always been passionate about? And how did you, how, did, how does one get into drag racing? I have. Uh, it's uh, It's been a passion of mine since I was a kid. So the subdivision that I grew up in, a lot of people in there had circle track cars, dirt track cars. I was I wasn't the least bit interested in that. My brother worked, my oldest brother worked at an airport on Fridays and he would wax airplanes and do this and that. Well, Friday night they turned it into a drag strip. And he said, Hey, why don't you come on out with me and check this out? Well, first time I saw it, fell in love with it. And that's kind of how my passion got started. Uh, we did soapbox derbies, that kind of stuff. So I always had this thing for adrenaline of going fast. I always had fast cars. We always street raced back then. We just, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. So of course, when I joined the Navy, uh, when I got stationed out in Pearl Harbor, a buddy of mine had a circle track car at, out of Barber's Point Air Station. Right behind that was a drag strip. I'd go out to help him, but they would find me watching over at the drag strip, seeing what was going on. Uh, so when I got out of the Navy here in Sullivan, Wisconsin, there's a drag strip right down the street. So I went out and bought a car and and got started and never looked back. It's a big hobby of mine. Uh, my daughter and I do it. We go to a lot of races. We get a little bit faster each year. So my car right now goes 250. Wow. So yeah, and why don't you just um, back up, backing up a little bit for listeners who might not be familiar. And the only reason I'm familiar is I saw it on your Instagram. Uh, explain what drag racing is and how that differs from, say, track racing or, you know, the more people might be familiar with NASCAR or something else. Sure. There's a couple different forms. Uh, the pro guys are the fastest to the finish line. So when you see the big top fuel guys like John Force, uh, you know, those kind of people. The light turns green. They go on the first one to the finish line as the winner. So and how long, how long of a, di- that's a fairly short distance or does it just seem that way? Cause you're going so fast. 1,320 feet, quarter mile. Okay. Quarter mile. Yeah. There's some races that I go to that are only eighth mile, 660 feet. So in the eighth, in the eighth mile, my car goes 204 mile an hour. And these are the cars, if you're if you're listening and you're trying to envision this, these are the ones with the great big back tires and little skinny front tires, and they're really long and low to the ground. Oh, the rear engine dragster. Yep. I have a pro charger on an uh, alcohol burning Hemi, makes about 3,400 horsepower. Wow. And so what does it take to, to maintain a car like this? Uh, are you constantly tweaking it and working on it? Um, it takes a lot of money. <laughs> it's an expensive hobby, I'm guessing. Right. It takes a lot of parts, it takes a lot of patience, and it takes a lot of help. I have a lot of friends that help me. Uh, actually, I have a lot of neighbors that race with me. Uh, believe it or not, uh, there is kind of a concentrated area right here. Uh, that, and we race in the Midwest, Ohio, Tennessee, uh, Illinois, Kentucky. So we kind of go all all through here. So I'm guessing you have some sort of a, a very large trailer to, to move this. I do. I have a 40-foot motorhome, and I have a 32-foot trailer. And my dragster, and it's just me and my daughter, and we hit the road on a weekend, and, and we go. That's awesome. You you do that with your daughter. Now, is she also driving, racing? No, I I didn't let her get into it. Okay. I, I could have, I suppose, but, uh, you know, it's the overprotective dad. Mm-hmm. Or is, it's just, it's very fast. It's a handful and anything could happen in a split second. And if something ever happened, I'd never forgive myself. Fair enough. Yeah. And how, how has, or maybe has not your fitness helped helpful or an advantage in, in that kind of it racing? Is. Uh, mobility is a big thing. Uh, you got to be able to get around. You got to be able to bend. You're always on your knees. You're working under the car, over the car. Uh, you know, you're sweating. A lot of times you don't get to eat um, because you're, you're starting in the morning. You're not finishing till late at night. You haven't had a chance to even get anything. Uh, all you're doing is pounding water all day. So, yeah, the fitness has been this stamina. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I hold wads at my trailer because there's other people in drag racing that are CrossFitters. And we all know each other, so they'll come to my trailer because I have a big awning. I'll be cranking the radio at 7 in the morning. You know, we'll be slinging jump ropes and kettlebells, and people are looking at us like we're nuts. But, you know, we go on a run and and uh, do the whole thing, and it's just great. Take CrossFit wherever you go. Yeah, that's awesome. You're, you're just taking CrossFit on the road with you, and you've got some like-minded um, friends to, to, exactly. uh, to do a wad. Um, all right. Well, kind of wrapping up here, what – you, you've got a, a, an amazing life story. It sounds like you're you're in a in a great place now. Really, really enjoying life. Uh, you got your di your diet kind of dialed in. Your your workout. What would you tell people, especially maybe somebody our age or you know 50s, 60s, who maybe has recently or maybe are now going through some sort of a medical event and find themselves on the on the recovery side of that, out of shape, maybe overweight with some side effects from medication quite often in that situation, what sort of advice would you give that person, man or woman, in, in terms of moving their life forward? I would say, take your health in your own hands. Do your own research. Because Western medicine, all they want to do is, what pill am I going to give this person today? How am I going to band-aid this ailment? Uh, you, that's, that's what they know. Doctors don't know nutrition. All they know is what pill, what pill does gets prescribed to what symptom. And that's what I went through. And I'm telling you, there was an angel on my back that said, you, you've got to take this under control yourself because nobody else is going to do it. Otherwise, this is how you're going to be the rest of your life. And you know what? Dementia and, and Alzheimer's and, and all that kind of stuff, it's scary stuff, you know? And like I told you, it's, it's never too late to take your, your health in your own hands Take from each person what what resonates with you. If it makes sense to you, like there's there's a movie out called The Game Changers on uh, Netflix. I I totally agree with that whole movie. It's all science based. Uh, Joe Rogan had um, Wilkes on his podcast with another guy. I don't know if you saw that or not, but even Joe Rogan said, you know, I got to take sides with you because everything that you've said is science backed. It's the truth about dairy. It's the truth about meat. It's the truth about disease. So I would just tell anybody that's listening, take your health in your own hands, find your own journey, and don't give up because there's hope. For whatever ailment you have, there's hope. You just got to believe. Well, that's beautifully said, passionately spoken, and I think maybe we'll leave it there unless you've got anything else you want to add. At this point, well, I'll tell you, I sure appreciate you, you having me on. This has been fun. And, uh, you know, I hope uh, this session, maybe if it just inspires just one person, if it helps just one person. It's it's well worth time spent. There you go. And I echo that sentiment 100 percent. So where uh, where can people find you to connect with you and learn more about you? Instagram, the best place? Instagram at dragster355. And I'll make sure I, I drop that into the show notes. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I, I appreciate your time and certainly wish you the best of luck in the future. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, that's our show for today, folks. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends and please consider subscribing, and giving us a five-star review. All the show notes and much more are available at our website at silver-edge.com. That's silver-edge.com. So until next time, stay strong.